All right, welcome back to Sandwell, where we're talking all things mechanical, and today we are talking about psychometrics, okay? Not to be confused with psychometrics, okay? That's something you use at the bar, 3, three o'clock in the morning, and you have what you think is going to be your forever love with you. No good. That's a different chart. Today, this is all about airflow, air, uh, the, the properties of air, and how we use this chart to determine what we need to do inside of a house. So let's take a closer look at this. If you're new to heating and air conditioning, or even if you've been doing heating and air conditioning for 200 years, because I know you guys are out there, I want to talk about the uh, psychometric chart here. Okay, This chart, I it was, it was actually this chart that I had on a piece of paper uh, back in 2007, whenever I really got into heating and air conditioning, and uh, you know, it really opened my eyes up to what all is happening with a system, and uh, and further how I can diagnose a system and determine whether a system is properly working. Okay, so let me pose an example here. Okay. You or your company sold a system to Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Smith or whoever it was, and she calls up a year later and says that she feels that you ripped her off, her furnace isn't working, her air conditioner isn't producing enough cooling, and she wants you to come out and check it out, make sure that it's actually working right. You go out, you check the refrigerant, you check the blower, you check all the controls, you check the thermostat, you look around, there's no holes in the ductwork, what's the deal, okay? Where do you go from there? Everything checks out, but you need some sort of documentation, you need some sort of, I guess, evidence and proof that this thing is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing, or you gotta determine whether it is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Maybe there's some other underlying issue. So, that's whenever I got into looking at this thing and using this to my advantage. Okay, so before, I mean, we can look at this thing and uh, determine how much, uh, you know, temperature and uh, how many BTUs a system is um, removing from a house, what it's putting into a room, whatever. Um, but before we get that far, we need to take a few measurements off of the, uh, off of the system itself. So, what you're going to want is a psychrometer, okay? I don't care what kind of psychrometer it is. Um, they're all over the place that, um, you know, you can probably, I don't even know. I haven't, I haven't shopped for psychrometers in probably 10 years. That's how long I've had this one, and I just love it. I bought this thing as soon as it came out, and that's it. That was the end of psychrometers for me. So, what I like about this one, this one's made by Field Piece. It's an SDP2. Um, I don't know, maybe there's an SDP3 now. Beats me, I don't care. This thing is, that's all you need. What I like about this one is it can be used as a standalone walk around um, psychrometer, or this wand here has the ability to extend like three feet, okay? Big old wand, and you can stick this in the ductwork and determine what the actual air conditions are at the appliance in the ductwork, okay, which you can't do with a lot of other psychrometers. Also, it's two port, okay, we got supply and return. So now what we can do is we can take a psychrometric reading from the return and one from the supply, and from there, now we've got all of the information we need to really start doing some serious diagnosing. I mean, we're not talking just slapping some gauges on a unit and looking cool. Um, now we're we're moving to Technician 2.0 here. So, you'll start taking these readings, okay? Let's just say, and I'm just going to pull some numbers out of, uh, you know, out of thin air. Let's say that the house is 75 degrees. Mrs. Uh, complainer lady, she, uh, it's 75 degrees in her house. It's August and uh, the sun's beating down and let's just say it's 75 at 40 percent relative humidity inside of her house okay so 
right at the return we've taken that reading. That's a good place to start. Now we go to the supply side. We take our other probe, stick it in the uh, supply trunk, and we take a, another reading. And let's just say that uh, we are 55 degrees on the supply. We're getting a, a good 20 degree drop there. And, but we notice our um, relative humidity is 70%. Well, that's no good. Um, so you would think. Now, again, if you've been doing this a long time, you already know that your supply side on an air conditioning coil, you're going to see higher relative humidity numbers on the supply uh, than you would on the return. Um, and that's, 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 that's fine. We're going to get into that. But uh, so you've taken that reading. Now, a lot of, if you're just taking your uh, temperature probes and you're sticking them supply and return or before and after the evaporator coil, you're seeing a 20 degree drop. You might just write that thing off as good. Yeah, I'm getting a 20 degree drop. It's August. I can't ask for anything more. That thing's doing great. But let's take another look here. We're going from 75 to 55, 40% to 70%, okay, is that actually doing its job? So, um, you know, the, before, you know, so let me back up a little bit, you know, I just want to go over this chart, so for those of you who have never seen this chart, okay, the very first set of numbers we're looking at, the very first scale is this bottom scale here. This is the dry bulb temperature scale, okay, on this particular chart, it ranges from 20 degrees up to 110. There are charts that go higher than that, okay? But for air conditioning, this is all you need, okay? It's very rare where you're going to see dry bulb temperatures in a house over 110 degrees or below 20. So this is a good chart. Now, if you're doing a lot of heating calls, uh, you may want to get a chart that goes up higher than that. So this is our dry bulb temperature. Like I said, we're looking at 75 and 55. We've already got two points there that we're working with. Moving on, you're going to see that this chart kind of goes up in a curve like this. And there's a bunch of lines that kind of follow that curve, okay? These are your actual relative humidity lines, okay? This one, we've got 10%. This one's 20, 30, 40, 50, all the way up to 100%. This is 100%, this upper line here. That upper line also has some numbers on it, okay? These numbers here are our dew point, okay, or our wet bulb temperatures, okay, and um, we, I'll show you how we use those numbers, and um, I use those all the time whenever I'm talking about adding humidity into a house. Uh, we're talking with a customer about humidification. I want to know what my dew points are because I don't want to be putting uh, too much humidity into a house where we could potentially be hitting dew point on windows or uh, thresholds of doors, things like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's what those numbers are there. And then they correlate with these diagonal lines that kind of go in this direction here. If we move all the way to the right hand side of the chart, these are our, this is where all of our grains of moisture are at. So these, you know, it'll tell you how many grains of moisture per pound of dry air. Uh, you know, we're, we're working with there. Um, so, again, you're going to use those numbers with your latent heat formulas and also humidification, dehumidification, things like that. And then finally, we've got this upper scale, which is outside of the chart itself. These are enthalpy numbers. Uh, that enthalpy number is a number that um, is it's kind of a culmination of all this information inside the chart. Uh, so where instead of looking at, you know, uh, two different points on a chart, it associates those two different points with one number. And it's it makes calculation a lot easier whenever you're out in the field. So there was a time where I was working for a large company um, whenever I was right outside of college and I was the only technician that was working for that company that was using the psychrometric chart to verify the size of equipment and to verify whether equipment is properly working. Um, that's the guy you want to be, okay? So it's 
it's really nice to have this information and know how to use this chart so that whenever you're questioned about something, you have solid evidence. You're not just saying, yeah, it was, it was cooling the house down. It was, it was producing cold air. Um, we want numbers that we can associate with all of that cold air talk. So, um, let's, uh, we're, we're going to look at these, um, these numbers a little bit closer. I highly recommend you hop on the internet or somewhere, get a hold of one of these charts. I have them printed out in my, um, you know, my binder in the service truck that I can quickly jot on these if I want to, if I'm at a customer's house and throw them away or keep them in the customer folder. But um, <clears throat> so let's take a look here. Again, on that bottom, we're gonna go back to Mrs. Uh, Jones or Smith or the lady that called up complaining. We're going back to her house. 75 in there. We go directly up to our relative humidity line, okay, which happens to be 40. That would put us right here where the tip of my finger is, and I'm gonna use my cool little wand here to uh, help me with this. So, 75 up to 40 puts me right there at the tip of my um, poker. Let's just say we had 50%. We would move up till we hit the 50% line. Okay, if we had 60, we'd just continue to move up till we hit that line. Now, once we get to whatever line that we have actually recorded this is what we have physically recorded from this point we can either move horizontally to the right and see how many grains of moisture are in that pound of air a grain of moisture is a little tiny I mean it's like the size of a, a wee little rice okay that is a grain of moisture so in a pound of air we would for for mrs. Jones house is there on on her return we would have probably 52 grains of moisture per pound of air. Okay, so in a pound of air, we'd have 52 little tiny grains of water droplets. <clears throat> Same point, if we move to the left, where we hit this 100% line, that is our dew point. Okay, so the dew point for that return air is right at about 50 degrees. Now, why is that important? Well, in air conditioning especially, we know that our evaporator coil must, must get colder than 50 degrees in order for it to start dehumidifying the air, okay? If it doesn't get down, oh man, where'd my chart go here? If your, humid, or if your evaporator coil doesn't get down below whatever your dew point is, it's not dehumidifying the air, okay? So let's just hypothetically say that we took the return temperature and humidity, we found it to be this point right here, and then we took a temperature of our evaporator coil, and we found that our evaporator coil is 58 degrees. Well, we know that we are not, that evaporator coil is nowhere near cold enough to actually start dehumidifying the air, okay? Likewise, if we found that our evaporator coil was way down here at 33 degrees, 30 degrees, 27 degrees. We know that it's probably about to freeze up, obviously, but we are way below that uh, um, that dew point, which is fine. I mean, we want to be below the dew point, but we don't want to be to the point where we're freezing up. Now, you would probably see that on your gauges. You'd see a really low return side pressure, but um, <clears throat> nonetheless, that just kind of gives you an idea here of what we're looking at. Now, if we go back to our return point, now we're going to follow this line diagonally up, and we're going to. This is going to be our enthalpy at saturation at 100%. Um, you know, relative humidity. So, our enthalpy for this return temperature, I'm going to say, it's actually right at about 26. Okay. Um, and you may not be able to see it on my screen. That's the the drawback to using a chart is that it is. It gets you to the ballpark, you know, it gets you in the zone. It's not going to be exact. Um, the best thing for that is they have apps for that, and I'll walk you through um, how to use an app, a, a psychrometric app later. But uh, nonetheless, 
we're going to look at this enthalpy number, okay? So 26, that is our enthalpy, that's the BTU per pound of air, okay? So that's, that's how many BTUs are in a pound of air at her return. So we've got all this, all these, you know, bits and pieces, all these numbers to work with. 75, 40 percent, 26 uh, BTU. We've got uh, about 52 grains of moisture. That's all at her return. These are good numbers to have. Now we go to our supply, and we do the same exact thing. Supply 55. We go up until we hit our 70 degree mark, because that's what we measured. Okay. 70 degrees, we can get our enthalpy, we can get our dew point, we can get our grains of moisture. Now here's the cool thing, okay? Remember, we've got 55 degrees at 70%, okay? If we follow this line horizontally to the right, we're going to see that our grains of moisture per pound of dry air is probably, oh, if I had to say right there, it's probably about 45, 45 grains of moisture. Remember, our return was 52 grains of moisture. So, even though our supply has 70% relative humidity, it has less grains of moisture per air. So, it is, in fact, dehumidifying the air. So, that's a good thing. Um, and I remember the very first time, you know, that I got a hold of a psychrometer and I felt like I was, you know, big man on campus. I had never even looked at one of these charts or taken a class on it. And um, I plugged into a return, and I was like, oh, this is really neat. I plugged into a supply, and I said, whoa, something is wrong here. It's just dumping humidity into the air. It's just spraying the, the supply duct with water. And uh, it was a concern for me because I didn't realize, um, you know, how that worked. <clears throat> and a good... A good kind of exercise that, uh, you know, or example that I came up with was, now bear with me here, I'm cutting up some cardboard off of one of my boxes. Okay, so let's just say that we've got some air. This air is 75 degrees. So if this piece of air represents, or if this cardboard represents air that's 75 degrees, we'll say that 75, this would be 80, 85, 90, so on and so forth, and then we've got 70, 65, uh, 60, 55, you, you get the picture, okay? It's almost like a thermometer here. 75 degrees. If this is 75 degrees on our return, this little guy is 55 on our supply, so I'm going to write 55 on this one. 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Supply and return. Got it? So, if we are on the return 75 degrees at 40%, I'm going to say that that's about 50%. So, this is about 40%. Okay, that line represents 40%. Therefore, Everything below that line is water, okay? That's all water. So, if we hold this up to our 55 degree air, and we saw that our 55 degree air was 70%, I'm going to say that that's probably 50, so there's 70%. Everything below that is water. Now, we hold these two up together. Our return and our supply. We line them babies up. And we see that even though 70% of this one okay, is full of water, it is still less than 40% of this bigger column of air. See that? So... We are, in fact, removing air, or I'm sorry, water from the air. So, it's just, uh, you know, I was just a young, young little boy whenever I figured that out. I was proud of myself. Anyway, so keep that in mind.
in the cooling season, your supply temperatures coming right off that coil are going to be high. You might see 85%. You might see 90 Hopefully you don't see much more than that. Otherwise, you may start actually seeing mold inside your, uh, your ductwork. So, that's... With, with these numbers here, now you write that down on your service invoice or in your computer, and um, you now what do you do? So there are a few constant formulas in, psych, you know, in psychrometrics that pertain to the BTU capacity of air. Um, one of those is our sensible heat equation, okay? And... 1.1 or 1.08, depending on how you were taught, 1.08 is our constant times our drop in sensible temperature, okay, times our CFM will give us our sensible temperature, um, you know, BTU capacity. So let's take a look at that. I'm going <clears> to. <throat> jump out of this for a second um, there's my son let's uh, go to our calculator here and so let's just run through this example here we had 75 degrees on our return minus our 55 degrees <clears throat> on our supply that's a 20 degree drop right good now we're going to multiply that times our 1.1, which is our constant. Now, here's the tricky part, because you've got to go to the supply house and get another tool. And that is a anemometer of some sort. You've got to know how much air is going through that system. You're not going to the blower motor and you're saying, ah, it's on medium speed. I think it's, uh, you know, 800 CFM. Or, um, yeah, it's on high we're going to test, you know, we're going to try 1200 or it's a four ton unit times 400 CFM per ton. So that gives me 1600 CFM. Yeah, that's what it is. Four ton unit, 1600. You're actually measuring the CFM. Okay. Because the slightest drop in, um, you know, or, or wrong reading will throw this calculation off completely. So get, go out and get yourself a good uh, anemometer or some way of measuring CFM. Um, you know, I don't care if it's one of those, you know, old school vein uh, type of anemometers or if it's the hot wire anemometer or I guess you could use static pressure, sta uh, static pressure probes. Um, but make sure you have good manufactured data to go along with that because uh, without good manufacturer data, you're just kind of shot in the dark. Okay. <clears throat> so let's just say that we measured 1200 CFM. Okay, that's a good round number to work with. And we got 26,400 BTU, okay, of uh, cooling capacity. And we're like, wow, that's, uh, that's like 10 grand off of where we need to be. And that's because we got to look at the rest of our equation, which is all the moisture, all this stuff over here, okay? We are, we know that we are below the dew point of our evaporator, or of, of the air. The evaporator is actually removing moisture. We gotta take that into account. There's a tremendous amount of heat, energy, wrapped up in all of that moisture that we are sending out the condensate drain. <clears throat> so, what we would then do is um, we would go, to where these guys meet, we'd go across to our grains of moisture per pound. Like I said, I think we were at like 45 on the supply and about 52-ish, you know, on the return. I'm going to use those numbers just because they're easy to work with and I, I don't have like a, a straight edge here. But let's just see what those numbers do for us. So we're going to go back to our calculator. Hey, buddy. And we're going to try this, okay? So we had 52 on the return minus that 45 on the supply. We have a difference of seven grains. That's how much, you know, we're removing seven grains of water. The next formula, we're not using that 1.08 or that 1.1 anymore. We're using a 0.68. That's our constant for latent heat, okay? We're going to take that 
7 times that 0.68, okay? Again, times our um, air uh, capacity, the, uh, the CFM, which was 1,200. And we're going to see that we are removing 5,700 BTU per hour of, uh, of, uh, of heat out of that condensation. So um, then what we would do is we'd go back, we would add this to, what was that other one? It was like 26,400. Yeah. And we would see that that air conditioner between the air drop and the condensation removal is operating at 32,000 BTU. And now you've got a good hard number to work with. You can say, you know, I took a, a measurement. This is what this unit's doing. Now that 32,000 is shy of the 36 that that, that Mrs. Complainer, her, her uh, air conditioner is rated at. She's got a three ton unit out there. Why is it only doing 30, 32,000 BTU of heat? So now we've got to look at something, okay? Why are we not removing enough latent heat? Why are we not removing enough sensible heat? I would say our sensible heat's pretty good. I mean, we're getting a 20 degree drop. Is there something wrong with uh, the, the air speed, okay? Um, do we need more air? Uh, are we not get is is our evaporator coil not hitting deep into the dew point and and not removing enough grains of moisture? On that example, it very well could be okay. Um, so that's uh, that's some some things you want to look at. Or you could say, ah, oh, you know, well, I wasn't really taking a good airflow measurement. Um, Maybe I should go back and take another good airflow measurement because with the hot wire anemometer, you've got to remember that this probe, you can't just jab right into the supply. You've got to actually traverse that duct in several different locations and average those readings out, okay? Because right in the center, you're going to get a really high velocity out towards the edges, okay? And like down in the corners, the air is just kind of tumbling across that you know, that fiberglass or that liner or even the sheet metal. Um, so let's just say that, uh, you know, you went back and you realized that you didn't take as good of a reading as you thought and it was actually, you know, you were getting more CFM than that. Then you can go plug those numbers into here and see where we're at. But uh, for now, let's go back and we're going to talk about kind of the last part of this. <clears throat> And that is these guys up here. These are the numbers that I'm using 90% of the time because it's it's a lot quicker for me while I'm out in the field and I gotta get on to the next one. Um, I can use these enthalpy numbers and um, get some formulas from there. So let's just say we're gonna go back to our example 75 at 40 uh, right there. We're going to follow it up to our enthalpy. That's 26, okay? 26 BTUs per pound of dry air on the return side. Let's see what it is on the supply. Supply, 55 up to 70. That's right there. Heck, that's right at 20. That's pretty good. I mean, usually, uh, usually you don't fall right on a number like that. But uh, make sure I got this right. 55 up to 70. Yeah, 20. So we got a 6 for our differential there. <clears throat> so let's go back. And this kind of gives you a, a, a eye-opener as to how accurate you must be whenever you're using these charts. So this is our last formula, and this is our total BTU capacity. And it takes into account the humidity. It takes into account your sensible, you know, um, your, your sensible and your latent heat loss. So our constant number in this formula is 4.45. Okay, you want to remember that number. 4.45 times whatever that differential was. So I think it was the 26 minus the 20. Okay, 6. Um, then we're going to go back and we're going to add or we're going to multiply that times our... Um, CFM that we recorded and you can see here that it comes out to 32,040. 
which actually I'm surprised it's that close. It's you know, I'm only off by less than a hundred BTU. So yeah, I got 32, 112, 32, 40. So that's pretty good. Um, but you can see this is a lot quicker. You know, you're not having to add your sensibles and your latents together, and you know, um, <clears throat> so it's uh, which one's more accurate? It's only as accurate as the readings you take. Okay, I mean, it's I, I see that there's less, um, there is less, I guess, uh, what do I want to say, error in using this chart than there is taking the actual readings. Okay, so, you know, as long as you, you know, use this chart as I've just showed you, uh, you're going to have, you're going to be leaps and bounds over the rest of the guys in your company, and uh, you're really going to impress the heck out of your homeowner, and uh, Mrs. Complainer, will, she won't be complaining anymore, because she knows that you know what you're doing. So, let's go back, and we're going to take a look at, oops, nope, we're going to go back to our... Um, example here let's just say that now we're scratching our head we're down in the basement and we're like man this thing's only doing 32,000 BTU I sold her a lemon well you know what's going on so you take your hot wire anemometer you go back in the supply okay you take a few more readings and you're like ah, you know I didn't I didn't do it long enough or I didn't you know take the right reading and you find out that it's actually producing um, 1,289 CFM. You were 89 CFM off, which isn't a lot, but it's enough. And I'm going to show you how much, okay? So we're going to take our CFM and we're going to plug that into the equation that we just did. So we're going to go 4.45 times our 6 of the enthalpy difference. Remember that was up in that, that corner there on the diagonal line difference that, that that it was here we'll uh, we'll go back oops times the 26 on the return 20 on the supply now we're going to plug our accurate cfm into the equation 1289 cfm look at that we picked up 2000 btu just by plugging in the information correctly, just by doing it the right way, okay? Imagine that, okay? Just, you know, 89 CFM made that much difference in our equation, and you're going to see that kind of extrapolated whenever we're talking higher capacity systems. You know, like, let's say we were off that much on a, um, a 5-ton unit or a 10-ton unit, okay? It is... A, it is very critical that you take accurate readings whenever you're trying to figure out capacity on a system. So, 34,000 BTU. You know, honestly, if I went to uh, Mrs. Uh, Complainer Lady and said, you know, this is what I measured, it is 94 degrees outside today, and it's the middle of August, the sun's beating on your condenser, it's rated at 36, and we're getting 34.4. That's not bad. That's I mean that's that's um, you know it's it, it's under what it's uh, I guess rated at, and that's another thing you got to look at is um, you know if the ratings of manufacturers' equipment look at what that rating temperature is at. Okay, so I know like heat pumps for instance, <clears throat> their rating uh, for their capacities are rated at a certain temperature. So it may be 40 degrees. It, this heat pump will give you 24,000 BTU at a 40 degree outdoor temperature. Anything below that, it's obviously not gonna give you what uh, it's rated at. Likewise with air conditioners. Air conditioners might be 80 degrees, um, I'd have to look. But uh, so if at 93 degrees outside, it's producing 34,000, I'm happy with that. You know, I guarantee if it's doing that at 93, at 80 degrees, it's probably producing in excess of 36,000 BTU. So, that's really, um, you know, that's really that in a nutshell of, uh, you know, going through these things and, um, you know, figuring, 
capacities of systems out. So go ahead, find this, find a similar one to this. I found that this is probably one of the better ones, uh, the better psychrometric charts that you're going to come across on the internet. Um, but uh, just go print 15 of these off, stick them in your van, and have them ready so that whenever you, you know, you can just doodle on these things, jot and throw them away or whatever you want. But uh, this is a really good resource, it's a really good tool to have in your arsenal. Um, above and beyond that, what can we do? How can we expedite the process of trying to figure out the, uh, the capacity of an air conditioner or a furnace? Or let's say we've got a piece of equipment that's working outside of the, the, uh, the limits of, of this paper here. So we've got a furnace that has a supply temperature of 130 degrees. Well, this only goes up to 110. We can't use this chart. Okay? So, what do we do? We are going to find some sort of an app. And this, okay. Sorry. So, how can we expedite the process? We can use an app. Okay? Now, this particular app I have had for, oh, I don't know, over 10 years, probably 13 years now. Um, Whenever apps first became a thing, okay, that's, like, I, I, I stumbled across this. I had to pay, like, $18 for it at the time, which was, like, more money than I had. And, but, I, I bought this thing, and, and I love it. Um, and I think it's changed a lot throughout the years. But, anyway, the nice thing with this is we can plug in everything that we just found on our supply and on our return, and this is going to spit all that out. It's going to do all the math for us. It's going to be much more accurate than trying to sit in our van and trying to figure out how many grains. Is that 55 grains or is that 58 grains? It's going to spit it out for you. So let's go through that example we just did, okay, and, and plug it in here. So we're going to click on this supplier capacity. And we're going to put in our zone condition. So I've got already up in here, dry bulb temperature. We measured that at the return, 75 degrees. And we're going to go to our relative humidity, plug that in, 40% humidity. Good. We're going to go to our supply. Our supply dry bulb temperature was 55. That's what we physically measured with our psychrometer at the supply, 55 degrees. Relative humidity, we found that it was 70% relative humidity in that supply duct right after the um, evaporator coil. So we're going to go in here and we're going to type in, uh, let's see, our CFM that we actually measured, okay, which was 1,289 CFM. And we're going to hit the little arrow button up there. And boom, there it is. It's got a cool little psychrometric chart on here. And this is similar to what we had found. You know, we had 75 at 40. We had 55 at 70. Um, you may be able to see on this, but there's a line here. That's a 50%, okay? Um, and this is where we're at. So let's take a look here. We're going to go all, well, let's look at our conditions here. Oops. Boom. And these are all the conditions in the in the supply. Okay, we have our 55. This there's our okay. So 45 grains. I was I'm surprised I was that close. Yeah, 45 grains per pound. Our specific enthalpy, specific volumes, vapor pressures, relative humidities, all that stuff. It's all right there. So let's go over here, and we're going to look at our loads page. And we have our supply, return, airflow rate that we actually measured, the 1289. This is our sensible capacity. This is how much sensible heat it is removing from the house, 28,000 BTU. Little, um, oh yeah, we didn't actually measure this one with the, with the corrected um, uh, airflow. Well, I think we had uh, 24,000 or no, we had 26,400 with 1,200 CFM. So now we're at 1,289 CFM. So that's how much sensible capacity we're removing. That 20 degree drop at almost 1,300 CFM, boom, 28,000 BTU. Latent air capacity, that's all the heat that's coming out of that condensation line. 6,000, we've got a half of a ton right there. So we go over here, boom, our total 
um, capacity on the system is 34,800, so almost 35,000 BTU. Let's, I'm going to zoom you in here take give you a better look at that. Okay, that uh, that's good. We're we're honestly we're only what 1,200 uh, BTU shy of what this thing's rated capacity is. You can't ask for any more than that. So, I bet you. Let's just let's hypothetically say. Let's go back, and we'll pretend that it's no longer 93 degrees outside. Okay, and let's say that our supply air temperature on an 80 degree day was it was actually dropping down to 65 percent. Okay, it's only a five percent difference there. So let's go back. Our zone is going to remain the same, 75, 40 percent. Let me see, I'll get you in here a little bit closer. Okay, 75, 40 percent. Let's go to our supply side, 55, and now we're going to stick in here, 65 percent relative humidity. Okay, because it's colder outside, or it's, you know, it's, you know, 10 degrees cooler outside, it's not as humid outside. Let's see what, how that affects. Our uh, flow rate is going to remain the same. So now you can see you know, it has dropped off just a little bit there. Let's go over here. Supply, 55, 60 per, or 55 degrees at 65%. Return is the same. All this is the same. Look at that. Almost, you know, it's over 9,000 BTU latent heat removal. Total capacity, almost 38,000 BTU. So right there, you know, just that's just a difference of a whether you go out in the morning or in the afternoon or whether you go out on a Tuesday when it's 93 or a Wednesday when it's 80 degrees, okay? That unit is, it's right there, okay? It's just, that's just, you know, the, the difference in a day. So 38,000 BTU is what that thing's doing. That's, uh, that's more than I can ask for. So essentially... You know, it's uh, you can tell that system's working good just with five percent humidity difference between you know one day and the next, or the morning and the afternoon, whenever you're testing these systems out. So, <clears throat> I hope that gives you some better insight as to how to use a psychrometric chart, what a psychrometric chart is, um, <clears throat> and the importance. One thing to, to keep mind of is that this chart here, okay, is great if you are at sea level, okay? Um, if you are in Colorado, you must get that app or you must get some sort of an app that has altitude correction on it because it will change the characteristics of that air, you know, quite a bit. Not a whole lot, but you know, you can see in that example how much just a little bit can really throw the big number off. So, this one is at sea level. In that app that I showed you, you can go into the settings and um, adjust for altitude, and it will uh, it will take that into account. So, um, the the reason I actually one of the very I remember one of the very first times I used this. Uh, psychrometric example for a customer was I got called out to a house and she said hey it feels like this unit is just running and it's never it's not removing any moisture from the, the house it just feels hot or it feels cool and clammy inside this house like she thought maybe the system was oversized we had sold her too big of a system or something like that um, so I went through with this and showed her exactly you know what was going on there and in fact that it was removing a tremendous it actually gave her you know this thing is removing um, you know three gallons per hour or whatever it was I can't even remember but um, with with this information I was able to give her a hard number that your air conditioner is doing what it's supposed to do uh, the fact that it's humid in here uh, is probably some other there's another cause for that and you know it was with a site inspection we went out and noticed that she had a cat door 
that was just stuck wide open and it was just letting all this hot air in um, from kind of like a crawl space type of area and all this humid air coming into the house that system would have had to just run and run and run and run and run to remove all that humidity from the house so it's good to be able to back up your system with enough knowledge and some hard numbers to prove that it's actually doing what it's supposed to. So now, what I like to do is I'll actually take this a step further, okay? And I will take this number that I get either from the hand calculation or from the app and I will compare that to what the BTU capacity is of the unit. So we'll take that 34,000, divide it into that 36,000 of rated capacity, and I will get some sort of a, I guess, thermal efficiency of that unit. But then from that, I can, um, I can actually determine the SEER rating of a piece of equipment. And all, that's just another step where we take the amperage of the condenser, the amperage of the air handler, I take the voltage of both of those, I will get a wattage of the outdoor unit as it is running, okay? I will get a wattage of the indoor unit, the blower motor, add those together, and then with that, I will divide that into a formula to figure out what the running SEER rating of that unit is. So, I sold you, I came into your house and I sold you a 16 SEER air conditioner. I go through figure out what the BTU um, capacity is of that unit, figure out what the um, total wattage is of the unit, what it's consuming, divide that out. I can give you a SEER rating and I can say that this thing is running at 16.38 SEER. Done, you know. Um, <clears throat> or you may say that, hey, the, the, the amperage is really high um, you know, it may be producing a good, it may be producing good output on the, uh, you know, the air side, you know, it may be giving you that 37,000 BTU. The amperage may be way out of whack, okay? If you've got an ECM blower and it's running full tilt, you know, up in the attic to give you that 1300 CFM or that 1289 CFM, but that ECM blower is just really wound up to do it. You'll see a really high amperage rating. You'll see a, a high wattage of your ECM blower. You'll put that into the formula and you'll say, wow, this 16 SEER system is only running at 13.1 SEER. What's the deal with that? So, it's just another good uh, you know, little, little tidbit to, to, to put into your job file. So, um, that's really about it. You know, it's... Uh, it's good to have this information. It's good to know this. Your homework is to go out and get yourself some tools. You go to your uh, service manager and say, hey, look, I got to get this stuff. So you're going to want a good, I like this one. It's a dual duct in, um, dual induct psychrometer. Um, I also have the matching field piece hot wire anemometer. Okay. Um, I'm not a huge field piece fan, but these uh, these are just great, you know. Um, I know Testo has some stuff out there similar to these, but uh, at the time, this is what I this is what I had access to. So you'll put both your probes in there, stick it in um, with the hot wire anemometer. Make sure you're using it correctly. You're not just jamming it in there and pulling a reading out because you may stick your uh, tip in there, see a reading of 1,690 uh, CFM, but in reality, you're only getting 1,400 CFM because you're not traversing all of the corners of the duct like you're supposed to. So just make sure you're using your equipment correctly. And then um, <clears throat> for my... Um, my electrical stuff, I, at this point, have just all, you know, fluke amp meters, and uh, I used to have a, a Milwaukee amp meter, and it, uh, I don't like it. Didn't hold up. So, I mean, I liked, you know, I, I, do, I did like it, but it just, it's not, 
it's not that good of a, a meter really. So I'm going to be getting the Testo clamp meter shortly. Anyway, that's, uh, that's it in a nutshell. If you have any questions, give me a call. Let me know. Otherwise, stay tuned. We're going to go over some more stuff. We're going to go over some real world examples of doing this on a few systems and show you how, um, how this actually comes to fruition here and, and, and works out. So until next time, be safe and uh, take care.